Andrew Holland uh, from uh, Ambit Investment Advisors is now joining us. Andrew, uh, good morning. You know, you've looked, you would have looked at the Aditya Birla Grassim deal. You know, what would be your first reaction? Uh, is, is markets, you know, getting much more pessimistic than what the impact of the deal would be? Because we've seen earlier deals from Birla Group, you know, when they separated uh, uh, Aditya Birla Fashion, when they separated uh, Ultratech, they have created a lot of value for investors. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, what surprised the market. I mean, apart from being a hugely complicated deal, um, you know, it doesn't seem to kind of make, uh, for, from, you know, from what I've read from all brokers' reports, doesn't seem to make, uh, you know, a great deal of, uh, of, of sense from a restructuring of the whole group point of view. I mean, if you're an ABNL uh, shareholder, you would say, well, what's the value of the, of the financial uh, business? And, you know, I've seen figures as high as, you know, the whole of the market cap. Um, so, you know, you're holding that, you know, that, that's the asset you're holding within, within that company. And now it's going to get diluted if you, if you swap into, into Grassim. So it's kind of disappointment on that side. And then as a Grassim shareholder, yeah, you're getting the financial, that's good. Uh, but the underlying feeling is that still that, that cash flow would be used to somehow fund more of uh, idea uh, cellular's uh, expansion plans or, or, or the, the kind of um, uh, move by Rio and in, uh, Geo into the market. So, you know, I think because of that, you know, people are just looking at the negatives rather than that there could be, you know, longer term positives. And as you said, you know, the, the, the Berla Group uh, is, you know, hugely uh, good in corporate uh, governance. So there's nothing I, I think that uh, we're worrying about there. Uh, you know, maybe just have, uh, have uh, you know, could have felt that the, the benefits would be longer term, uh, but obviously were thinking that, uh, or shareholders are thinking that, you know, they, 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 they don't want to wait that long. Um, and, and there's a lot of moving parts that will have to happen before you start unlocking the whole value of this restructuring. So I think that's where the disappointment is coming from. Right. Uh, how would, uh, you know, you view this deal? Uh, say if, uh, you know, somebody asked you for advice that how would you go ahead and, uh, you know, vote for this? Would you vote in favor or not? What would be your first reaction? No, I think, uh, I think you know, I think I'd probably, uh, as a shareholder, if I was one, then I'd, I'd want to hear from the management first um, to understand the deal, the deal in more detail. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, what they announced yesterday is, 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 is part of the overall plan. Uh, but obviously, you know, their thinking behind it, uh, I think, would, uh, would be something that I'd have, to, uh, I'd have to listen to first before deciding what I'd want to do. Right. Uh, you know, as far as Aditya Birla Nuvo is concerned, I mean, you would have tried to study the company earlier. It was a very complicated sort of a structure. And the main play over there was, or the main trigger over there was, going ahead, different businesses would get demerged, we would get long-term value unlocking coming in. Now that, you know, except for the financial businesses, the other businesses are getting merged into Grassin. Uh, that's also a disappointment, or, you know, the long-term value creation may take some time of separate businesses. Yeah, so that, that's you know that's what you've uh, you, you've highlighted is correct. I think if you're an ABNL shareholder, you were expecting demergers, and as I said, you know, there's, I've seen estimates where the financial business, um, you know, is valued, or the some parts of it all is kind of valued at you know, the kind of whole of the market cap of ABNL. So, you know, you would be expecting to benefit from that. Now you're going to go into a merger, uh, of which you're going to own less of that financial services company and obviously that you know divestment whether it's an IPO or, or sale or whatever it might be uh, will be you know sometime next year uh, if markets are favorable so there's a, a long wait period now uh, for all of this uh, in terms of unlocking value for you and you know with the valuations and you know with the sort of investor patience especially in such sort of deals you think that wait is quite long Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the merger itself would not kind of take place till the end of the year, from what I can work out. And then they talked about uh, possibly mid-year, calendar year 2017, uh, to do something on the uh, on the financial services side. But we all know these things, you know, can take longer. And obviously, it depends on market conditions in the middle of 2017. Right. Just uh, looking at the financial business, so 
In AB Nouveau, it's the financial services as well as the fashion business. These are the two most lucrative business, right? Yeah, but I think, uh, I, I think you know, I've always expected the financial services side to be the one which was the, 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 the biggest growth area. I mean, you know, if you just look around all of the uh, different uh, parts of that, you know, whether it's MBFC, asset management, insurance and so forth. I mean, you're seeing valuations that are being put out there. So it's not that difficult to do a sum of parts, which as I said, I've seen uh, figures as high as the whole market cap for the financial services business of ABN, so ABNL. So, you know, that's where I think people were getting more excited, um, you know, given the valuations you have within the markets at the moment in each of those constituent uh, parts of the business. Uh, and that's where I think the disappointment from, from, from uh, is, is being seen and, and why the share price is, is down so much today. Right. You know, let's talk about some other names as well, apart uh, from this deal and really what's happening uh, in the market. So firstly, markets are up 77, 78 points, you know, irrespective of this deal, looking in decently strong. You think any correction will be short-lived with the sort of liquidity that we have? So... You know, as I think we spoke last time, you know, we're, we're all markets globally are driven by liquidity at the moment. And, you know, you sometimes think, you know, in the last few days, you're, you're thinking that maybe the uh, liquidity is starting to ebb down. You know, what we have is, is, is a difficult market in that, you know, the indices might not be going down because obviously ETF money is still coming in and propping up the index. Um, but, you know, some of the, the movement in the, in the PSU banks yesterday was quite severe. Um, so I think once a correction comes, once this liquidity bubble is burst, and it will be at some point, um, then you know the, the, the kind of um, the, the move downwards could be quite sharp because I don't think ETFs will uh, you know will, will be uh, will be staying around for too long if they think the risk off trade is, is back on. Um, so that's the concern is that you know you can't fight this liquidity, so it could take markets a lot higher from where we even are today. Um, so we're not. I'm not trying to be overly negative, but uh, one, once it does change, um, you know, then uh, you know the, the, the valuations you're seeing in the Indian market at 19 times one year forward are just not. Uh, you know, not, it's just not fair value. So there's, you know, you'd have to see some contraction in in in, in the PEs first. Right. Uh, you know, as far as the overall, uh, you know, valuations are concerned. Globally, equity assets are trading at a higher valuation. That means that India can also for a while trade on higher valuations? That's exactly what's happening. I mean, you know, what you're seeing globally is that, you know, liquidity is chasing all assets. All assets are going up. Uh, and obviously, equity markets are, you know, are, are kind of, uh, you know, this kind of, well, there's two parts to it, and two parts that worry me. Um, one is this kind of Tina effect, there's no alternative but equities. And, and secondly, this left out feeling that, you know, you have to put money to work because your markets are moving up. Um, and, and, you know, the latter one is, is the more worrisome. So, you know, as I said, I think once... Um, you know, the liquidity bubble is burst, then, you know, valuations will, will have to, to, to crunch down. Um, it depends what bursts that bubble, but uh, once it does, then, you know, India, whilst I think is, you know, longer term, I have no problems, it's the global factors which worry me more. Uh, and as we saw in January and February, you know, that, that sentiment can turn very quickly uh, in terms of negatives. And there's lots of negatives out there, it's just that we're just ignoring them at the moment. Right. Uh, as far as earnings are concerned in Q1, uh, no reason to see any upgrades or only towards the end of Q3 or Q4 when we have, say, six months, nine months numbers, we would be in a position to, you know, get, uh, get, get an exact number of what can come in. Yeah. So, you know, I think everyone got a little bit more excited uh, or the analyst community got excited that the last set of uh, quarterly results or the back end of them. Um, and I think, uh, if anything, this quarter's results have been... Um, you know, reasonably kind of, I say, neutral to more disappointing. So we certainly haven't seen any, you know, major increases in uh, in, in uh, analyst estimates. Um, but anyway, our forecasts have been um, before the monsoon or the uh, the outcome of the monsoons was always between five to ten percent earnings growth. If the monsoons are okay, uh, and obviously with the seventh uh, pay commission uh, pay hike coming through. 
then we could see that, that earnings growth be more 10 to 15, but I don't see it being higher than that at the moment. So it is a, a bit of a second half uh, uh, expectation in terms of earnings starting to pick up, uh, but I think at 19 times one year forward, that's pretty much priced in at the moment. So you're saying that uh, you know positives uh, are priced in. Can you just tell us that what are the sort of negatives that uh, we are looking at, or what can you know be negative? Can Fed rate hike be a negative? Can be a big negative? What are the potential risks that you're seeing? So you know, here's the uh, here's 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 the, here's the negative. So um, you know, I, I'd be doubtful if the Fed do go ahead with a with a with a rate hike uh, this year. Um, I mean, they seem to be fearful that uh, you know what they do will have uh, too much of an impact, and, and you know here's the, the dichotomy: is that you have you know GDP growth at 1.2 percent, um, uh, which would tell you that the jobs data, um, should, you know, the, the, the unemployment rate should be a lot higher, and the unemployment rate is actually quite low, which is telling you that your GDP should be growing at 3 percent. So, you know, there's something in between that's going wrong, and I, I'm not sure what it is. Um, but obviously, all of the money that is being thrown into the system um, is, is really clearly not working in GDP. It might be in jobs growth, but is it, you know, is it real jobs growth in terms of people spending money? I think the second factor, which is, uh, again, you know, we're kind of ignoring because of, of, uh, of liquidity, is the, is the trade data that came out of China on Monday. Uh, which showed, uh, which was pretty, pretty bleak actually, um, but it showed um, imports from Australia down 22% and imports from Korea down 12. So it tells me that China is still slowing, um, you know, quite, uh, quite, quite rapidly. So you know, whether would they have to depreciate or, or at least cut interest rates, uh, if not look at depreciating the currency. Then, of course, we still have Europe, which is kind of hanging on uh, uh, by a thread to, you know, whether it's going to be in recession or not. I think we're a little bit too complacent about Brexit and the impacts. But if you look at the housing market in the UK, it's already trading downwards in, in central London by up to 10 percent. Um, you know, so, yes, it could be attractive if you're a foreign buyer. Um, but, you know, that, there's a pain going, going through the, uh, the, the, the housing market now, which is going to... Uh, ripple have a ripple effect into people's spending power as well going forward. So there's all of these things which are negatives, which uh, I'm afraid we're just ignoring at the moment. At some point, fundamentals do come back, and uh, you know. So what I think is going to happen is that I think there's in the bond market something that will give at some point, and I think that's where the bubble is uh, at the moment, and then that will rapidly go through to currencies, commodities, and then stock markets. So it will create a situation like 2013. Yeah, you know, it's quite interesting. It, it feels a little bit like that, right? I mean, all, all emerging market bonds, uh, you know, are being, being, everyone's rushing to buy them. Uh, corporate bonds, uh, emerging market corporate bonds, everyone's rushing to buy them to get yield. Um, so, yeah, it feels a little bit like that. I've seen that picture before. I kind of know what the ending might be. The good news is that India is not as vulnerable as it was back in 2013, and maybe it's a, a, another country, maybe it's, a, a, I don't know, Thailand or an Indonesia, which has a currency problem this time around. Um, but, you know, we are in better shape. Uh, but when global factors, you know, happen like that, then obviously markets will obviously have to fall. Right. Uh, you know, how would you look at... Uh something like an Axis Bank or Yes Bank. So they are going up. They have been moving up recently. Uh, yes Bank, good set of numbers, did deserve a re-rating. Axis Bank may not be that great set of numbers. But MSCI buying is keeping them active. And we got the MSCI data coming in today. So do you believe after the MSCI buying, you know, they could see a little bit of cool off? Could well be. I mean, obviously, the MSAI uh, buying will obviously skew skew those uh, the, those two banks uh, in particular in the in the very short term. But you know, you know what happens as we all know is that if market momentum you know is is, is continues, uh, then there's no reason that they, they should. Um, but obviously, once that buying dries up, if markets were to fall, then uh, you know the, these two could be uh, could see a little bit more kind of. Um, fall than, than, than some of the other private banks in the short term. Because, you know, Axis Bank's uh, results were, were actually very poor. Um, but because of uh, liquidity and probably because of this uh, MSCI uh, 
um, rebalancing, then uh, you know the share price has actually kind of moved higher, which is quite surprising actually. Right. Uh, you know, can you also just tell us the bond bid that you just explained? Is that very positive for NBFCs and for banks? Which which part? Sorry. Uh, the previous answer you said that you know bond markets are seeing a great amount of action coming in, with rates coming down. Rates have come down further. Is it very very positive for the banking or financial institution, or you believe it's largely in the price? You know, so if I look at it globally, um, you know, the banking sector has actually been the, one of the you know, they have performed, but they haven't been a great performer. And in fact, if you look at the European banks, they're at valuations near, near to 2008. Um, so, you know, lower rates really haven't helped them. I think for India, though, obviously it will, uh, because I think we have two things going for us. One is, you know, GDP growth will start to accelerate in the second half of the year, um, and that will hopefully, you know, help uh, corporates kind of think about, uh, you know, starting to, 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 to either expand or borrow more. Uh, and that will help the banking sector. So I think, you know, in that respect, it's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not saying that interest rates are, are the great catalyst for, for the banking sector. They have, the PSU banks themselves have a huge amount of problems. And you've seen that in the results. I mean, you know, I think the problems, you know, the identified problems in terms of, uh, you know, the big, large uh, corporates which are in trouble, um, as kind of, you know, is now being kind of, uh, you know, we're kind of overlooking that part and, and, and looking at the next part, which is the small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, which is the next level of problems for the banks. And you've seen that consistently now with the PSU banks having to put more aside for that. And, and uh, Bank of Baroda, I think, was, was one of them. So, you know, there's still a lot of problems in the banking sector, which is not going away from us. Uh, liquidity is pushing these share prices higher uh, with the, along with the markets. But uh, fundamentally, there's no reason to own them yet. Right. Uh, you know, as far as uh, the banking space is concerned, you know, generally you say a top or the bottom happens when IPOs start coming, a lot of fundraising activity starts happening. But it may not be the case for the banking sector. We are looking at Yes Bank raising a lot of funds. Suti is likely to sell Axis Bank stake. RBL is coming up uh, with an IPO. Uh, uh, you know, don't you think that uh, a lot of fundraising is happening? Or for banking, it is different because it keeps on adding value rather than, you know, just look at the valuations? Well, if you look at the longer term, I mean, obviously, you know, the Indian economy will continue to grow at a, at a fast rate. So, obviously, the banking sector would have to be a, a big beneficiary of that. And, you know, if I'm a if I'm a private bank and I can get access uh, at a at a good uh, at a good valuation uh, to funds, and I know that, you know, a big large swathe of the whole sector, i.e., PSU banks, um, you know, are not in a position. Uh, to take advantage even when the economy starts to move higher or better, uh, then it's a great opportunity for me to get out there to either expand branches, do M&A, whatever I want to do, uh, and take their market share permanently away from them. And I think that's what the private banks are doing and have been doing consistently. Uh, but this is a, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a great opportunity whilst you know, these banks kind of you know, get to grips um, you know, with their MPA problems um, and it's across the board. And, you know, if I just take, say, SBI and their merger, I mean, that's going to, you know, those mergers are just at the wrong time. I mean, you know, management focus should be on, on, on rebuilding the bank um, rather than merging, which would just cause a lot more headaches and management, you know, focus away from um, the, the core banking business. So if I'm a, a Yes Bank and Access or a HDFC, I'm just going to say thank you. I'm going to go out there and take your market share. Right. Uh, you know, as far as uh, some of the other beneficiaries are concerned from the NBFCs, so we've seen uh, housing finance companies do very well. Uh, we've seen a lot of <coughs> NBFCs getting re-rated. You think that's a slightly safer space? It's a slightly better space uh, to be in rather than these banking names because of the asset quality, you know, that uh, they have shown constantly in terms of managing in a better way? No, I mean... You know, I think there's two parts to this. One is obviously the, the, the banking space, the private banks have, you know, whilst they've got come unscathed, you know, they've done a lot better than the PSU banks. 
um, and that's where they're taking market share. The MBFCs have obviously seen there's an opportunity outside of the BSU banks to take their market share, which is what they've been doing. Uh, but I think the valuations for MBFCs now are fairly much reflecting that kind of you know, near-term growth. Um, and, you know, of course, with all of these MBFCs, like, you know, any bank as well, is how they manage that growth going forward. So I think share prices might pause a little bit in, in the very short term. But, you know, I think what we're trying to say here is that, you know, the, the space which is going to suffer the most is going to be PSU banks. And the big beneficiaries are MBFCs and, and private banks. Um, and, and that's the way, you know, it continues to, to look. Uh, to me, will will continue to, to to happen going forward. So, you know, PSU banks here. You know, we can. I don't know why the the share prices have moved up. Right. Uh, you know, uh, just a word before we can conclude. Any new names that you've liked after the recent results that we have seen? Companies which have raised their guidance or given a good set of numbers where you believe it will continue. Uh, you look at a lot of mid cap, small cap names. Anything that you like? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, we haven't, uh, you know, we don't just buy in the back of results. Um, you know, we, we, our sectors that we've been favoring have done quite well, which has been cement, the private banking sector, um, selectively some MBFCs, the auto sector uh, have been our kind of core holdings. Um, and about a month or so ago, we, we, we got more excited about the valuations in pharma. So we've been adding large cap pharma. Um, over the past month or so, which has paid off very nicely, and we think that you know re, uh, the, the valuations are, are still at a level where our re-rating will, will take them another you know 10 to 20 percent higher from where we are today. Right. You know, just wanted to ask about the pharma pack uh, as you mentioned. Do you believe that uh, you know the way to look at it is that majority of the regulatory issues are behind last two years? Even for large cap pharma space, has not been particularly that good. And we are coming to an end. You know, it's, it's always a mean reversion sort of a cycle. You know, three, four years, they are very good. And three, four years, probably, you know, you see such problems coming in. So we are coming towards the end of a regulatory issue. Uh, and you believe that Indian Pharma will adjust. And again, we will start seeing approvals coming in. Yeah, you know, I, I, you can't really say that you're at the end of it because, uh, you know, the FDA obviously will have their, their own, uh, you know, different views on that. But my, my, my our take was two months ago was that, you know, with all the FDA, um, you know, notices being given, that uh, you know that the worst was over for the sector, and valuations had been you know crunched down to a level which we felt that all the bad news was there, and therefore, as companies worked on you know, um, kind of trying to uh, overcome or, or, or kind of you know put put straight their own uh, processes. For the FDA, that those approvals would come later on in the year. Um, therefore, valuations were compelling to, to jump in because they've been pushed down too high, and the fundamentals anyway were looking okay for, for, for quite a number of the, the pharma companies. So that's how we looked at it. And now we think that going forward, uh, as approvals start to come through um, from the FDA, that that will be the next kicker for share prices. Right. And, you know, in pharma, it's very different in terms of mid cap and large cap. So any investor should focus on the large cap names because the performance over there has been very good, especially for someone, uh, you know, which has a history of over 10, 12 years. Yeah, we've, we've kept to the large cap pharma. We think that's where um, obviously, um, you know, any kind of um, uh, changes that uh, have to be made for FDA could, could be made a lot quicker. Um, than, than some of the mid-cap companies. And, and again, I, 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 you know, we'd, we'd rather stick with the large cap first and then look down as and when we need to. But the value is in the large cap, and that's where we, that's where we focused our attention. Right. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning.